Okay, section uh, one, two. I start off with um, some vocabulary words from section one, one. Individuals, variables, quantitative, qualitative, population sample, and so forth, nominal, ordinal, and interval levels, ratio, excuse me, levels of measurement. One, one, wasn't it? Section one, two, random sampling. This is pretty much the, um, the key to getting any quality data and making sense of it. It used to be a term way back in early programming, computer programming, I'm going back to the 80s and 90s. It used to, people used to say garbage in, garbage out, meaning if you were programming in, you made some mistakes with your um, symbols, whatever, program wouldn't run, garbage in, garbage out. Well, the same applies to getting a valid survey and being able to interpret some results and having these results uh, be true. All right, random sampling. What I would ask you to do, once again, is Al does a nice job in this section one, two video. There is a portion, this happens from time to time, where he goes kind of down a dark alley, so to speak. He talks about the uh, random number table in the back of a textbook. You won't have to um, do this, all right? He spends, gee, probably a good five minutes talking about generating these random numbers in the uh, table in the back of the book. You can kind of skip over that because we're not going to be doing it. It doesn't happen all that often, but it occasionally doesn't. When something is in a video with Al, and I'm not going to hold you responsible for it, I will always tell you what it is. All right, focus points. Explain the importance of random sampling. Construct a simple random sample. Mm -hmm. Simulate a random process, not really. But the last part, just like levels of uh, measurement, where it's supposed to be important section, important part of section number one, one. Uh, stratified cluster systematic and convenience. Notice I skipped over multi-stage sampling. I'm not going to talk about that. We'll speak about stratified cluster, which are confusing sometimes. Systematic, pretty straightforward, and convenient sampling. Those are the ones that we'll concentrate on. Here. In this section, we examine several widely used sampling techniques. One of the most important is simple random sample, sometimes referred to as SRS. In a simple random sample of any measurements for a population. A simple random sample of end measurements from a population is a subset of the population selected in such a manner that every sample size and from the population has an equal chance of being selected from. Um, what does that all mean? Simple random sample, not only does every sample of the specified size have an equal chance of being selected, but every individual of the population also has an equal chance of always being selected. However, the fact that each individual has an equal chance of being selected does not necessarily imply simple random sampling. Remember, for a simple random SRS, every sample of a given size must also have an equal chance of being selected. All right, so leading up to what we're going to be talking about in further explanation, this is just in these situations. Uh, open space around metropolitan areas, is that important to people? Well, I guess it is. Players in the Colorado lottery might think so. Some of the proceeds of the game go to fund open space and outdoor recreation space. The idea is very similar to the lotteries in Massachusetts. You play a dollar, you pay a dollar, you choose six different numbers from one to 42 here in Colorado. If your numbers come up, your six numbers come up, and you win, in this case, $1.5 million. Coincidentally, when we get to Chapter 4, we'll compute the probability of winning the lottery, and we'll compare that to the numbers on a lottery site, but that's always a way, Chapter 4. This is Colorado. All right, so the question is he asks us, is the number 25 as likely to be selected in the winning group of six numbers as the number 5 is? Oh, yeah, because the winning numbers constitute a simple random sample. Every number that's drawn in some sort of a Sort of a window or a container, every number has the same chance of popping up. The 5 is just as likely to pop up as the 25. Could all the winning numbers be uh, even? Sure they could. What's to prevent it? Could be all even, could be odd. You know what's interesting with the lottery? People think if uh, 
one, two, three, four comes out in the lottery on a Wednesday, that one, two, three, four can't come out on a Thursday. Well, it's a simple random sample. And furthermore, the numbers don't remember what came out the day before. They all have an equal chance. All right, one, two, three, four can come out today and come out tomorrow, come out three days in a row. <clears throat> Your friend always plays one, two, three, four, five, six. Could she ever win? Well, why not? It's just as likely as any other six number combination, right? Listed numbers, six numbers, is as likely as any other. It, is, it tells us there's there five million two hundred forty-five thousand seven hundred eighty-six possible six number groups. We'll actually be able to figure that out when we get to chapter four. But one, two, three, four, five, six has an equal chance of coming out as any other six numbers. Simple random sample. All right, this whole idea of every sample size having the same probability all right the same chance consider this example consider the students in my stats class let's assume that we were in class and there were 40 students four rows of 10 students each i uh, to select a sample i flip a coin comes up heads i choose 20 students that sit in the first two rows 10 in the first 10 in the second comes up tails i choose the 20 students that are in the last two rows now, the question is, does every student have an equal chance of being selected? Oh, yeah, it's a 50 50 shot. Heads, I pick first 20 in the first two rows, and tails, I pick the 20 in the third and the fourth. Every student has the same chance of being selected. Not a problem there. Is it possible to include students sitting in row three with students sitting in row two? Well, no, because it's heads, I'm picking the first and second row. Tails, I'm picking the third and the fourth. I can't combine the second row with the third row, all right? Since now every sample size of 20 is not possible, all right? I can't get people in the first and in the fourth row. So every group of 20 doesn't have the same probability or chance of being selected. It's either first and second or third and fourth. No other combination of 20. So this is an example of not being a simple random. Every group of 20 doesn't have equal chance because I can't get the first and fourth or the second and third. Consider the students in your stats class, same idea. There are four rows, 10 each. It comes up heads, I get the first two rows. Tails, I get the last two rows. Describe a process where I could get a simple random sample size of 20. What I could do is assign everybody a number, these 40 students. Just count off one, two, three. Everybody has a number from 1 through 40. Um, take some ping pong balls, label them, put them into some sort of a hopper, spin it around and randomly draw out 20 numbers. I could have kids in the first, second, third, fourth. All right. Every group of 20 would have the equal chance of being selected. That's how I would um, get around this and use simple random sample to get a size 20. Assign everybody a number then randomly draw out 20 numbers. Everyone would have equal chance, but every group of 20 also has a simple random. The thing is, is that we'll, you know, always consider simple random sample to be in effect when we do this. All right, so he says assign numbers one through 20, use a random digit table that Al talks about, or use some sort of computer software to draw the random numbers. When we use this term simple random sample, we have a very specific criteria in mind. One proper method of selecting a simple random sample is to use a calculator based or computer generated program. Notice the term random should not be confused with the word haphazard as far from that. So he tells us, you know, number every one, like I just did, use a table or a calculator or a computer program and select 20 people. Simple random. Here's an example here where if you wanted to generate some random numbers with your TI calculator. The directions are right here. I wouldn't have you do this on an exam because everyone would be selecting different numbers, but this is how you would do it. You can read this on your own. And here again, you know, I sent an email out. I'm doing this uh, Thursday, what is it, the 28th? And I'm a little disappointed that, um, but no, I think it made me positive here. I was happy to see roughly, not roughly, 18 out of the 25 students. I've already logged in and see, see what's expected of them. 
and the other seven, here again, I can't be too critical. I don't know what's going on with those seven people in their lives. Hopefully they're doing well. I don't know sure their job situation and family, but uh, hopefully they do well again because this is not all that difficult. It's very doable, as I mentioned in my audio presentation. But you got to log on. You got to do the work. That's just kind of all it is. All right. Suppose you are assigned a number one, and the other students in your stats class call out the consecutive numbers until each person in the class has his or her own number. Explain how you could get a simple random. Explain how you could get a simple random sample of four students from your stats class. All right, so here again, you assign everybody a number and use a computer program to pick out 20 numbers. That's pretty much it. Now, he says this. He says, explain why the first four students walking into a classroom would not necessarily be random. Well, maybe those four people are early for everything. Or maybe they had a class in that same room, a class before. Or maybe they had a class across the hall. There's, a lot of, there's no definitive one answer. Explain why the four students coming in late would not necessarily be form a random sample. Well, maybe those four students are late for everything. They're just late people. All right, so it may not be representative of the entire class. Explain why the four students, let us see, sitting in the back row would not necessarily form a random sample. Or well, maybe those are just very shy people. They always sit in the back row and they never, I don't know, maybe they, not, they don't participate. They're just very shy people. Here again, that's not representative of the entire class. Explain why the four tallest students are not necessary. Or well, maybe those four on the basketball team or their athletes. Or well, their parents were told. I mean, everybody, you know, it's not picking those four people is not going to be truly representative because not everybody's going to be tall in the class. Here again, these are just samples. There's no one definitive right answer. All right. And here are some possible all right, answers vary. So you wouldn't see this on an exam. Just a question for some thought. Sampling techniques. This is the bulk of what section one, two of about. Convenience sampling, I think the word convenience gives it away. Simply uses results or data that are conveniently and readily obtained. In some cases, this may be all that's available. In many cases, it's better than having no information at all. However, convenience sampling does run the risk of being severely biased. For instance, consider a news person uh, who wishes to get opinions of the people about a proposed seat tax will be imposed on tickets to all sporting events. The revenues from the C tax will be used to support the local symphony. All right, so the news person stands in front of a concert hall. Well, these people obviously like symphonies. And the first five people that come out, he says, Hey, think it'd be a good idea if we tax sporting events and we toss the money into symphonies? Well, yeah, I guess uh, that would be, I guess they would say yes, but you can see the bias behind it. You're interviewing people who are at a symphony and asking them, if we collect money to support symphonies, would they be in favor? I think they would be. All right, it's good advice to be very cautious indeed when data come from methods of convenient sampling. You want to get an idea of what people think about anything going on. I want to be specific, but you call up five of your friends. Now, if they're your friends, chances are you share something in common, so chances are they're going to think the same way you're going to think. So well, the results from that sample would be severely skewed. Right. Another popular method is called systematic. Now, the word here again, the root word system, kind of gives it away. In this method, it's assumed that the elements of the population are arranged in some natural sequential order. And then we select a random starting point, select every cake element. For example, people lining up to buy concert tickets are in order. To generate a systematic sample and ask questions regarding systems of age, smoking habits, income, and so forth. We could start with the fifth person and then every fifth person after that. So it would be the fifth person in line, the 10th, 15th, 20th, 25th, and so forth. You see the system there, every fifth person or every second person or every fourth person. The advantage of systematic sampling is that it's easy. However, there are dangers. Dangers in all of these. Danger would be, let's say you're, you're at a fabric mill and you're checking uh, for mistakes in material. And you check every 16th yard that's produced by the loom. Well, maybe that the loom makes a mistake every 17th yard. Here you are checking every 16th. All right. 
In this case, a random starting point may or not result in the detection of the flawed fabric because of the large amount of fabric being um, produced. So systematic sampling has its, its faults, its limitations. Although we assume throughout this text that simple random samples are used, other methods of sampling are also widely used, and one of those is called strata. Strata, and the last one will be cluster. These sometimes are confused, and I'll do my best to point out the difference. All right. Stratified sampling. Groups or classes inside a population that share some common characteristic are called strata, plural of stratum. All right, cluster sampling um, used extensively by government agencies and certified research for affirmed organizations. In cluster sampling, we begin by dividing the demographic area into sections, and then we randomly select sections or clusters. Key word here is every every member of the cluster is included in the sample. For example, conducting a survey of school children in a large city, we could randomly select five schools and then include all the students. That's the key word. All of the students. All right, so let's see if I can just differentiate, differentiate if I can say it, cluster and stratified. If I was doing stratified sampling, well, here's a map of uh, Massachusetts. The strata could be the different counties, Franklin, which uh, was the Middlesex, Essex, and so forth. If I was doing stratified sampling, the strata are already self-identified. Then what I would do is pick a sample from each of these different counties, Berkshire, Franklin, Bristol, and so forth. Probably I would base it on the more people that were in each county. I would draw a sample. Maybe if Middlesex obviously had more than, let's say, Bonstable, I would choose more people in Middlesex than I would in Bonstable. But different counties are the strata. Now, if I was doing cluster sampling, I would use simp I would number these, give each one of these counties a number, and I would randomly pick maybe four of those numbers, maybe those numbers way to Hampshire, Hamden, maybe Suffolk, and maybe Bristol. Once I had four of them picked, then I would you hear the you hear the phone in the background it always happens. Then I would pick every one in those four counties that I chose. That's the key word. Strata and clusters, meaning is kind of close. The differences in cluster sampling, once you've decided on the clusters, you pick everybody in that cluster, as opposed to stratified, where you would use simple random and just pick some of them. So that's when you see the word all, you know it's a cluster versus a strata. Stratified sampling. All right, these are five videos. I didn't embed them. Um, they're worthwhile watching. The shot, maybe four or five minutes, it really gives you a good idea. Um, SRS, now here's the problem. Here's the problem, is that on an exam, these are special questions where they have five different answers. What I'm gonna say is since simple, simple random sampling is part of cluster sampling, it's also part of stratified. If the answer is supposed to be stratified, but yet include simple random, then it causes a problem. I will never give you a question on an exam where you are to answer SRS, simple random sampling. It's included in stratified and it's included in cluster. I do think though on one of the homework problems, and see if I can get rid of it, it is simple random, but I'm saying on an exam, please do not answer simple random sampling because it's included in stratified and it's included in clusters. Pardon the phone ringing. It's not the phone ringing, it's the doorbell. It's just the nature of what we're doing here. You know, it's, it's just like occasionally I'll misspeak. I, as soon as I put the first video up 1-1, one, one, I realized that I was going through the very end of it, I think it was the problem was length of day, and I miss and I misspoke. I called it interval, and it should have been ratio. So, if I catch myself, I'll make the correction. But it's um, not perfect, and I'll tell you that right away. You're trying to put these together, you're going to misspeak. Um, I'll do it a lot, but if I do, I'll correct myself. It's not as easy as one, two, three. Commercial, that's easy. All right.
explain the difference. These are the ones that usually confuse confused one with the other, stratified and clustered. In stratify, we, we do an SRS, all right, on each stratum, which is already self-identifiable. It's like a, a high school. you got freshmen, sophomores, juniors, and seniors. Those are the strata. That I pick a certain number of freshmen, a certain number of sophomores, juniors, and seniors, stratify sampling and cluster sampling. You know, he talks about here you got a district with, let's say, 26 schools. You pick five of them and then you survey everybody. The difference those five schools are your clusters and you're picking everybody in those five schools. Keyword is all. Gallup is one of the best known. Um, agencies out there that do uh, do surveys and here you can read this uh, I'll post the actual PowerPoint obviously they're conducting a survey on behalf of Major League Baseball um, the target audience is people 12 years of age and older who watch at least five hours of Major League Baseball it would be difficult this year because who knows what baseball is going to look like baseball probably with no fans the findings from the Gallup telephone surveys are based on Gallup standard national telephone samples. What we're seeing here is um, people are less likely to participate in polls. And with all the telemarketers, scam calls, and people see a number they don't recognize. It. I know I am. I'm very leery of picking up the phone. So these agencies, these polling um, agencies, colleges and the like, are finding it more and more difficult to um, get people to answer. Here's something else that you may have noticed. You know, on the news, radio, um, TV especially, they'll give you some statistical data based upon surveys, but they never tell you, oh, by the way, this was stratified. This was cluster sample. Uh, we surveyed 1,000 people. We surveyed 500. This is a demographic. It's, it's almost like they don't think the American public, <clears throat> excuse me, the average person is bright enough to understand how sampling is done. That won't be you after this course. You'll have a leg up on how this is all done, and hopefully it makes you look uh, critically at uh, numbers and say, mm, that don't make much sense. I don't know if that's true. But TV pro, TV shows, news agencies, they don't bother explaining. Here again, I think, is they don't think the general population is bright enough to understand what a stratified sample is. And you know what? They may be right. All right, so how do they do it? They they randomly generate phone numbers. And they call these people, and hopefully they get somebody in there. You know, it's over 12 years old. that watches at least five hours of baseball. All right, it's a random digit dialing, RDD. And that's how these people get their data. And what's interesting is if you do it properly, you know, you've got 320 some odd million people, you know, in these samples, these uh, surveys they do, they may do as, you know, as as little as a thousand people, but if it's done properly, simple randomly, where you're taking a proportion of people in all these states, the uh, the data is pretty good. It's pretty spot on. All right, each individual within each contacted household reached by a landline interview is sought with an adult 18 years or older. And just you know, here again, people just don't have the time nowadays. Someone calls, ah, I want to know your opinion about this. Well, maybe they're lonely. They haven't been out. They have. They've been social distancing. Maybe they want to talk to somebody. But as a rule, you know. And then these tele, you know, I say telemarketers, but most times you get these calls around supper time. The worst calls you the ones you get at eight o'clock in the morning. You know, hey, can you want to answer some questions? Uh, I don't think so. I don't think so. You know, many people say, you know, how come I've never been selected? Well, there's about two hundred. This says two hundred million. There's about two hundred. All right, if you did um, 200,000 polls of 1,000 pollsters, you know, assuming that no one gets called twice, all right, in a single year, depending on where you live, but even with 250 polls, the chances of you getting selected is very, very small. So because you haven't been selected doesn't mean that they're not doing polling. It's just that a lot of people, all right, it would take 200,000 polls of a thousand people to reach 200 uh, million people. So, um, the chance of being uh, interviewed at least once is, is rather small. So if you haven't been selected for a poll, hang in there. 
they'll get around to you and then if you want to give them your opinion you know it's there's such, such uh, surveys as what they call self-selective where you decide to call in and vote who wants to be a star begin the program you had to call in and it would take those results uh, self-selective uh, not very good not very reliable you make the decision to participate as opposed to you run. All right. Important part of uh, an employee compensation is benefits, benefits package, health insurance, life insurance, child care, and so forth. Suppose you want to conduct a survey of benefits package available in a private business in Hawaii. Does it sound bad? Send me to Hawaii. I'll do this. You want a sample size of 100. Some sampling techniques are described below. Categorize. Uh, each of the techniques has either being stratified, systematic, cluster, convenience. Uh, use postal zip codes, pick a random sample of 10 zip codes, and then include all. There it is in red. You're including all. You've got cluster sampling. Send a team of five researchers, assistants, research assistants to Bishop's View, wherever that is in downtown Honolulu. Let each one select a blog. Here's a key thing here. Each researcher can have the rest of the day off if they give you 20 responses. Well, convenience. Wait for it. Very, very convenient because you do 20 as fast as you can. Get 20 people. You can go surfing at the beach. Use the island business directory. Select a starting point. And then every 50th, every 50th, you see the system or systematic sampling? You select the 50th, the 100th, the 150th systematic sampling. A group of businesses is uh, divided according to their type, medical, shipping, retail, and so forth. All right. Uh, then select a, a sample of 10 businesses. Well, you see the medical, shipping, retail, manufacturing are strata. All right. You're not selecting all of these businesses. You're just selecting 10 of them. Hmm. Strata. Uh, randomly select a MMH, a MMH facility from each of the five geographic regions and then include all the patients. Oh, you know, I kind of gave it away by putting the word all in red and bolding it out. Clusters, sampling, all. Every uh, the beginning of the year, instruct each MMH facility to survey every 500. That's uh, systematic. 500th, 1,000, 1,500. Every 500, that's the system, systematic system. Instruct each MMH facility to survey 10 discharge patients this week. You know, pretty much convenience, right? How hard is that to do? So hopefully that helps. Uh, make sure you watch Big Al, as I call him. Ignore the part where he's talking about using the back of the book for random generated numbers. You can get pretty crazy in your... In your um, Quest to be purely random. But then again, the more randomness you have in your survey, the better, more true your results are going to be. All right.